You had the big Lost Boys thing that was, it was big on the news. St. George was flooded with kids. I think the youngest that we had was 13 to 20. You know, obviously they want the women there because they need, they need the wives. Because in the religion, you know, you're this prize. And I feel like when they left, it was more of a push. We got more phone calls. They found their own ways out. We yeah. just got them after the fact to help them back into the world. When they, they all came back from Alaska, they all lived together. There was probably 10 of them yeah, at was, least. It was very bizarre. <laughs> and Ben, you're like, I'm used to living with 28 siblings. What are yeah. you talking about? <laughs> yeah. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high-demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. If you're only listening and you want to see our faces, go to our YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness, where you can join in on the conversation. You can like, subscribe, <laughs> leave some comments for our guests here. It really means a lot when you leave those words of encouragement because they are coming on and bravely telling their stories for all of us to learn from and grow from. So today's guests, you've probably heard me talk about them before. I've mentioned them in a few episodes, and I finally convinced them to come on <laughs> and talk about their stories. It is my cousin and her husband. Her husband grew up in the FLDS, which is the Fundamentalist Latter-day Saint Church, a break off from the mainstream Mormon church back when they stopped practicing polygamy and these other breakoffs started happening because they wanted to continue the sacred eternal practice of polygamy. And you may have heard of the FLDS because of Warren Jeffs, who is now in prison. There's a whole documentary, Keep Sweet, Pray, and Obey, about Warren Jeffs. But his life specifically, our guest today, was before Warren came into power. So we're going to hear a little bit of a different perspective. So thank you so much for joining us, Ben and Wendy Barlow. Thanks for having us. You're welcome. <laughs> it's so good to have you here. So Wendy's one of my favorite cousins. I just have to say that. We grew up together and grew up doing a whole bunch of crazy things, um, even though we weren't supposed to because we were supposed to be good little Mormon kids. But, you know, <laughs> here we are, <laughs> the rebels of the family. Exactly. And Ben, it's so awesome to have you as part of the family. And I've really enjoyed getting to know your story just through Wendy and through our brief conversations. So I'm just really excited to hear more of that today and dive a little bit deeper into your life in the FLDS. Thank you. Yeah, we have a lot to talk about, including the reason I wanted Wendy on here as well is because she was actually helping you and helping your siblings leave the FLDS and they call them lost boys. So we've had so many comments asking if there's men out there who have 10, 12 wives, one, two, three, four wives, what happens to all of the other boys who aren't getting any wives. So I really wanted to bring you on and get your perspective on what happens to the boys that they kind of either they don't really care if they leave or they push them out and they call them lost boys. So did I do that justice? Yeah, that's yeah, that's pretty much what what happens there. Yeah, they would. Uh, they didn't really care if we left, but they did. Like looking back, you can see that maybe they didn't care as much as you thought. There's obviously a, a numbers game there. If there's more women getting divvied out to one dude, then mm -hmm. you're going to run out of women. That's why they started marrying younger and younger and younger. Right. So we would get um, kind of pushed off and not so much like pushed away, but it was the women never left. The girls never left. It was just the boys that left. And I think part of that of us leaving is we would get out and, you know, and work in construction and things and see the world where the women, they stayed, you know, at home making sandwiches, making babies, cooking dinners. That was, that was their role. Yeah, that makes sense. So actually, before we really dive into your specific stories, would you mind just telling everybody kind of the basic rules around living in this compound? Because you actually were in this kind of isolated community, right? Yeah. So growing up there, you didn't think you were different than anybody else. We thought we were of a higher power, if you want to say it that way. We were um, the chosen ones, God's chosen children. Mm -hmm. And, you know, oh, they call us Nephites or what have you. Gentiles, they didn't know any better. So we, were, we would forgive them a little bit. But the people like me that left religion, we were damned and the things of Satan were going to be upon us and, you know, we're apostatized. Yeah. So you had that fear if you left, God would strike you down with the bolt of lightning 
you know, type of deal. To get back to your question, how it was living there, you, you are in fear of God, right? Instead of having a loving God, you know, mm-hmm. like you, they would, you would think they would teach, but, and, and in a way they would say that, yeah, it's a loving God, but if you really got down to the nuts and bolts of it, if you didn't do what they said, then the blessing of Satan would give me upon you and you're going to be damned to hell. I was like, oh, well. Yeah, that's terrifying. So you were living what you would call the fundamental fundamentalist practices of Mormonism. So polygamy was the number one thing because, as we know, Joseph Smith said you need to practice polygamy to get to the highest level of heaven, right? Yeah. So men needed to have multiple wives. I don't really know. Did they ever talk about if women had to be a plural wife to get to heaven? Because that was never mentioned, at least from what I know, in regular Mormonism. They had to have three wives. And so if you were a fourth wife, you were already going to make it into the celestial kingdom. Um, people are probably familiar with That's how the, top the one. <laughs> kingdoms work, right? Yeah, so there's like one, two, or three. I forget the other two, but that's the one that you're focused on, right? So you had to have three wives, and you know, my dad only got two, so I don't know what happened there. He no. missed the mark. <laughs> <laughs> you missed the mark on that one. <laughs> Poor guy. Yeah, so you had to practice polygamy. Modesty was... Very, very important. Yeah. At least I know that when Warren came into power, uh, Rulon's son, things just got really out of control, I would say. I think that's safe to say, right? The Warren was kind of in control when I was there because his dad was on thing near hospice, I guess you would call mm. it. He had all sorts of you know cash flows. He had a full-time doctor. He had a full-time nurse you know, all around him all the time. He was like on oxygen when we'd go to church and... Warren would get up and talk for his dad because he'd say, oh, my dad can't talk, which he couldn't. The EMT would have to go rush him out half the time. His uh, little beepers would start going off, whatever, because he'd come hooked up to all this stuff. That was towards rule or Warren's reign, whatever. That's how he kind of took power. He just slowly, his dad was dying, and he, you know, put himself into power. So, And I wasn't okay. there for that day, but, yeah, whatever. Okay. So before Warren came into power, what were the modesty standards for men and women? So we just have, we'd have to be to your neck, all the way clothed, and you'd have a full body suit, which is your garments, right? I think the Mormons have a two piece. We'd have a full piece with a flap in the back. And it's, it was like a, a paint suit with buttons up in the front, kind of like the old Western movies. <laughs> That's our garments. But then we'd be fully clothed and we'd be out there in the construction site fully clothed like that. And the women in their little prairie dresses would be out tending the garden with these big fluffy dresses out there pulling weeds in the garden and making sandwiches, what have you. Right. I think when most people think of Mormons, they think of the FLDS because it's been so widespread, just a photo of what the FLDS women look like. Because I found, at least when I went different places other than Utah and people found out I was Mormon, they'd be like, oh, kind of look at me like, you look different, or that's not the kind of Mormon that I know of. (laughs) And they would ask how many moms I had, and I would get so mad Um, (laughs) because I didn't know that people were still practicing polygamy. I was like, guys, that was over a long time ago. I was so naive. But the dresses, that's something that a lot of people associate with Mormons. So it's the big puff sleeves. Were you allowed to, or were they allowed to wear short sleeves or was it always down to the wrist? No, so you had to be to wrist and ankle all the time. Okay. And they would wear pants underneath them, giant dresses too. Okay, like bloomers or actual like denim? Yeah, bloomers and denim. Oh, really? My sisters wore denim probably most of the time. I don't know. I'd have to, I guess I could text her. I asked her if I could text her. (laughs) (laughs) Long pants underneath their dresses and like big boots. They had to cover everything. That sounds miserable in the summertime. And we lived in the desert. Yeah, it was. It's hot. Yeah. Okay. And then as far as I'm aware, when Warren came into power, he even decided what colors were allowed. Was that also a thing when you were there? So he started in uh, Alta Academy. That's what it was called. That's where he kind of started his his reign. You know, that's how he got, got in, if you per se, was he was the principal there. It was my principal. Okay, so the FLDS had their own private school. So I would love for you to tell everybody what that schooling was like, because now that you're out, I'm sure you have a different different perspective on what it should have been. I only went to third grade, but anyways, third grade in Warren School, that is. So in the Alta Academy, I'll just tell you how the classroom was. So we had 
the boys on one side and the girls on the other side, even though we were probably all now thinking back on it, they were all like cousins and family members. It, it shouldn't have been that weird, but to have us all sit together, you know, the boys and the girls, but that's how we, that's how they arranged the seating throughout their whole entire school. They separated them, the men from the women and having worn as the principal now looking back on who he is, it really is kind of creepy and sick yeah. of how close he got to some of the the girls and some of the the boys too. That's kind of how he started his doctrination or whatever you call it. You know, he's better better than Hitler, I feel like, as far as like how many books he wrote in and how many um I don't know, he, he would put out flyers on how to do things with your wives, right? Really? He would put out audio tape on how to do that stuff, too. He, he's a creepy dude. You know, after hearing all the stuff that he did, because you don't hear about that stuff until you're older, you know, because you don't get those um, books until you're older. You don't get the the special documents or whatever you call them. I don't know what he called them, priesthood documents or something like that. He wrote down everything. You know, if you think back on how Hitler took, took reign or whatever, you know, he wasn't the big hot troll when he started out. You know, he's just like Warren. But Warren, he didn't have to use death. In, in a way, he used fear, mm -hmm. but nobody he had to personally kill anybody. But he's, he killed a lot of families, that's for sure. But his uh, that's where it started. It was in his, his uh, Alta Academy. In, in, uh, it's Alta, right, up there by the – we lived in Sandy at the time, so we'd drive clear to his, his school up there. Okay. Did you have all of the subjects that you know now are in schools? Because you have kids now. So did you have all of the same subjects? So we would um, we would turn, we'd do like our ABCs and our one, two, threes and all that stuff. But it was priesthood history. That's what it's called. Mm. <laughs> we would have priesthood history and we would have, um, I don't know. He would just, he had so many things. I, I just can't remember them all. I, after years and years of it, I forget them all. but. He had so many different papers that he would draw up his own like storybooks, teach us how to read, and he'd do his own like math stuff. And when we would get some books from the outside world, we'd have to have one of the priesthood men there, and then one of the they call the women, but one of the wives would go and edit all the books. They'd have to go draw in draw in sleeves on every one of the clothes, draw in a um address on some of the the girls they talk about swimming or something like that the women would be in like i don't know just like figurines right it wasn't even because it was back in when i go to school probably 80s i'm sure the books today are picture perfect back then but then they had to draw the so the women that were swimming because we'd read books with how when people swim we'd draw the girls in their full prairie dresses to <laughs> For the storybooks, he would edit everything. Everything was edited by Warren. It was crazy. Yeah. Now, think about it. But then it wasn't crazy. It was, it was normal. Mm -hmm. Everybody like, like you or the outside world, we would, we would be like, oh, you poor, poor lady. You didn't know what was right. You know, you <laughs> feel sorry for you. poor lady wearing a swimming suit instead of a full dress. <laughs> to <swim> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So did they have to uh, actually wear dresses to swim? They they didn't even have like yes. bloomer type of things? No. So we would never, you're never supposed to get on clothes except for the shower, right? Oh. So we when we would swim, we, we'd had bigger shirts than this with a giant pocket. You know, you've seen probably the polygamous boys. They have the giant pocket right there. So when you swim, when you swim, swim forward, that pocket would fill up with water. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you're in your whole garments and full on clothing swimming like that so i never knew how to swim jeez i cannot <laughs> imagine trying to swim in a big dress i feel like that's really dangerous yeah that was really fun when they would when they would leave to look to see them swim was like a child learning how to swim they would all jump in the pool we're like, all adults like little there. kids just jumped like in. cannonballs and learning how to dive and they'd come up and all choke on water because they didn't know how to oh, hold their breath no. right <laughs> But they were just so happy to swim. Yeah. And that was one really fun thing to watch. It was like a kid again. <laughs> they didn't get that. Oh, my gosh. That's so interesting. Wendy watched me learn how to swim at her in their pool. So she was like, why are you so, why you, why, why you want to go swimming again? <laughs> she, she grew up with a pool. Yeah. You go like, play by the pool and just get the sun. <laughs> no, let's, go, let's go play. 
<laughs> I remember her whole family watching me swim. That's funny. They were like, everybody's sitting outside the pool. We're in, all me and my brothers are inside their pool, just swimming away. Yeah. And they're looking at us. You guys are like old. <laughs> oh my gosh. What are some other things that you found simple pleasure in after you left that you weren't able to do before? Everything was so brand new when you, when I finally left, everything was so new. If you could walk down the street and I put on a different shirt than what, you know, the, uh, the long sleeves, whatever I put on, I didn't wear pants for the longest time after I left, just being able to wear what I want to. That was, that was pretty nice. I can tell you even like, for me, we go work out, we go running. He would wear jeans. Oh no. When we would go for a run. Like, no, you can wear shorts. That's what we used to run. Like, that, everything we did was yeah. you're fully clothed, right? Here's some basketball shorts or some like running pants. You feel you naked. You're like, oh, my knees are showing. Hold on. Oh. No. <laughs> it took a while for him to even just put on something that's actual, something to work out in. Yeah. It, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. With well, the pants that you had to wear, were they denim or were they more like a dress pant? No, they were all denim. Okay. We would get different color ones. My parents would get creative. We'd, I'd have a green pair, a black pair, and like denim, like a thousand denim ones. All right. So we'd have the three. And every, all of our shirts were darn near the same color as our pants anyways, green, black, blue, you know, stuff like that. So when you're seeing us out on the job site, we were all dressed the same, just a different color. Were you allowed to buy store-bought things or did you have to make everything? So they got crazy after Warren took power and wouldn't let people eat at restaurants and wouldn't let people um, go different things. But that wasn't how it was when I was there. We could go buy store-bought and things. And that's how I got to know the people in the world. I'm like, no, these people are actually looking me in the face and saying thank you and, you know, serving us a meal. They're not, they're not all crazy about, you know, this, they're not all evil and try to, they tell us that the outside world was um, trying to come steal us and take us away and turn us evil. Really? As I worked, I could, I got to meet tons of people and I wasn't how it was. Right. That's kind of how they keep you isolated is yeah. by demonizing the outside world. So you don't really fully understand. And it's, it's also something that we see a lot in high demand groups where they kind of call out the behavior that the outside world might mention for example i've heard some groups being like yeah we're a cult we're a cult of god and so when someone says you're in a cult and they're like yes we are but they don't really yeah. know what that means like the real meaning of it and they kind of hide in plain sight in that way so when it does come up you're like it's the confirmation bias where you're like oh yeah they said outside is just sex drugs and rock and roll and then everything starts to fill yeah. in with that confirmation bias and until you realize yeah. that you've been controlled and manipulated you're not able to see oh they were just lying to me and i'm just seeing what i want to see when i'm in the outside world and it's hard for them to get out of that that um how they see it that way you know my dad's still there and his his Wives have all been ripped from him and his kids have been ripped from him and he, he's still believing it. Mm. So it's that confirmation bias. It's, it's a real deal. He's, he's, uh, he got in a car accident and broke his hip and broke his arm and broke, um, his collarbone and damn near died. My mom died in the car accident oh, no. and he lost everything. Couldn't walk for a long time and he still believes it. Like I was like, Oh man, they left you to die. And you still believe it. And took all of his money from the insurance payout. And all the kids were in the accident as well. And all the kids got money and he took their money as well. Gave it all to Most Warren. Most of them. He gave the money to the church. He gave it, it all to Warren, to Lyle Jeffs. Oh. I'm sure what he was thinking is he's trying to buy his way into the celestial kingdom. <laughs> right? No, no joke. That's probably what... I'm sure he didn't like consciously think it, but that in the back of his mind is like, oh yeah, this will definitely help me get there or maybe get me my third wife and I'm good. But right. He didn't get it. And that's something that is so discreet, even in mainstream Mormonism and people will deny it right and left. But when you talk about this pay to play situation, like you have to pay to get into the highest level of heaven, they're like, that's not true. But you can't get a temple recommend if you don't pay your tithing, which is 10% of your income. And it sounds like in your case, it's even more extreme where they're expecting you to give most of your money to the church in order to be worthy or be holy or close to God. Is that true? Yeah. 
So I want to talk a little bit about how they had you working at such a young age. So how old were you when you first held a job? I think my first paying job where I received a check. So you always were working, right? That was what they call it, the work. You know, they call it the work. You were always doing something for the church or for the, you know, for the FLDS. You're always, you're always working for them. So we were either seven, eight or five or whatever it is. We we're out hoeing weeds in the, in the neighborhood. So you're always doing something for the church, helping them clean up the neighbor's um, construction site or, you know, do something like that. But I think I was probably seven or eight when I got my first job working at a countertop shop. And, uh, then from there, I always had a job. I just bounced around from doing cabinets to framing to concrete to sheetrock to every single trade. That's kind of how they um, raise all their kids. We don't get an education, right, per se. You know, getting out and finding out that some of the kids did get get education, that kind of sucked for me to find out because I was like, oh, damn, I thought we were all the same. Mm. But no, I, I think it was just um, my dad and some of his brothers that got really strict on it and followed Warren's, I don't know what you call it, his commandments to the T, you know, only had us doing priesthood things, didn't get us an education and all that stuff. Yeah. And then to find out some of these kids got an education, I was like, what, you went to high school? What? You got all that? No way. But whatever. It's good. Yeah, that must be incredibly frustrating. I have to wonder, though, how you were able to do construction with just a third grade education. I imagine you would need more understanding of math to do that, right? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I got my GED after all that too. So I think if, if you're willing to learn, you'll, you'll figure it out. So I, I know how to do a lot of different things. I call them the plig way. And there's no way to explain it other than I have to show you how to do something. Like I could square a wall. I could build this angle. I could do that. But it's not... It's not like um, engineers would do it. They draw it up on a piece of paper first. I can see it in my head how I'm going to do it. I don't know how because um, I wasn't taught that way. Mm. How, and he knows math at- very well because he's been doing it his whole life. Yeah. So it was hand in hand. I could build stairs or what have you at a younger age because we just learned how to, we are, learned how to do it the plug way. Right. We didn't do it. A, that's why I call it now. I don't think I call it then. I just knew how to do it. <laughs> The profits way, I guess, is what we'd call it. <laughs> the profits way. <laughs> yeah. So you started working at a really young age doing construction. How old were you when you were first hired to be on a construction site? On a construction site, I think it's probably, I don't know, give myself in trouble, probably 10 or maybe 11. Wow. Working in, uh, what was I, in Park City? Oh, you know, in, I don't know, we worked all over the place. So we would live in Colorado City. We'd jump in a bus. And go to the job site, either rent a house or something like that, and then build up a town and then sell the house or rent the house or give the house back and then move back to Colorado City. We would, but we'd be home every weekend to work on Warren Jeff's, it was called Saturday work projects, but we'd, we'd have to be home by Saturday to go work for Warren for free, basically. We would call it the priesthood. We wouldn't say Warren, but we could work for the priesthood on Saturday. We couldn't work on Sunday. Sunday was Lord's Day and we, did the Lord's Day for real. Oh. We'd start before breakfast, we'd start out with oh what the hell do they call it? Morning prayer. And it would go on and go on, you're starving by the time you get breakfast, you know, the women would bring out breakfast and gobble it up. And we have a meeting in the morning at the church with the whole with the whole town on Sunday. And then that would get over and then we'd go back home to our house and eat lunch and then go back for our churches were like four hours. The back of my skull from sitting in church for so long on a Saturday has an indent from sitting on the on my head on the back of the back seat. Oh my gosh! <laughs> if you're like this, and you'd be asleep. But if you're like this, you just look like you're looking up at God or something, right? Yeah, you're praying. So we, even my <laughs> brothers have like a little indent in their skull because we sit really? on a chair for so long. Oh my every gosh! Every week they can feel it when it's right there. <laughs> yeah, Wendy and I had to sit through three hours of church growing up. But four sounds torturous. And you would go home and eat and then go back to church? And then go back. So it was all day. And then Claire, until like seven or eight, we would have, I don't know what we called the, the late night ones. But yeah, it was only for the priests and men that could do the ones late at night. And you thought you were cool to do it because you were finally old enough to hang out with the older kids. So it was a, it was a fun thing to, to go do those things, to go and hang out with all your cousins, to go hang out with all your, your friends or what have you. Mm-hmm. And to go to church was kind of exciting too because you got to see all your 
we're friends. We'd googly eye each other in in church. I'm sure you would do this to some of your buddies or something at church, right? <laughs> or maybe you guys did different height, different um, hand signals. Yeah. But whatever. So, what were you actually learning in church? What were the main things? It would be all Warren's scriptures. He like I wasn't joking. When I said his his wall of scriptures could probably fill this whole house. Like he got intense. Like especially after he started taking rain, he would. Uh, I feel like he came out with a new book every other day. I never got to read any of his other juicy ones that were for the people that got married, but I've heard about him. Yeah. So I'm like, oh man, crazy. It's only crazy now. It wasn't crazy then. It was just so to hear what he had to say now, it's crazy. But when you're in there to hear him say, oh, this is how you do this with your wife and how you do that with, you know, this is how you act this way. That wasn't. It was from God. We we appreciate it. We were glad. We were thankful for it to have a spokesperson on earth, you know, from God, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what we were told. That's what we're all told. <laughs> Warren was uh, a God spokesperson on earth to the to the crew there, to the to Colorado the City church. people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wendy, is any of this shocking to you or are these things that you knew already? I knew. When I first met him, I knew of the FLDS religion. Because I went to school down in St. George. Right. That's in southern Utah. So I played on the soccer team there. And when I traveled to other states, I knew of the FLDS religion beforehand, but this just made me more aware. But when I traveled to other states, people automatically thought, like, oh, how many moms do you have? Yes. <laughs> and do you so have annoying. horns? Where are your horns? Who knows where that came from? Uh, yeah, I don't know where that. Say, why are you missing a mom? <laughs> that would be our reply. <laughs> are you missing yeah. a mom? Because we get because you get asked it so many times. So would be imagine a little kid piping up and saying that. That was our always our funny get. We get them <laughs> like, are you miss, are you missing one? <laughs> Maybe we did take one of yours. No. Oh my. Maybe gosh. my dad did steal your your mom. You never know. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so. I mean, I'm kind of jumping ahead here, Wendy, but when you guys met and he started telling you more of the intricate details, were you just completely shocked or what was your reaction? So much shocked. I think I was just more interested. I actually loved hearing about it. His upbringing, I don't think was like in my eyes, horrible. I know they did horrible things. Yeah, I feel the same way too. I just like interview somebody else (laughs) because I felt like I grew up pretty, pretty, I don't know. I didn't get screwed like everybody else did. I think some of them, I I think the um, later kids suffered a little more. They didn't have a father in their life. He had a father and and had somebody to look up to and somebody to learn things from. So nobody could have babies or what have you. When Warren took power, that's what he, he would tell everybody how they could and couldn't have sex when they could or couldn't make babies, right? Mm. He was in control of everything when he when he took rain. Oh man, you couldn't eat at a restaurant. You couldn't. You had to only eat what they what the priestly women. So the women actually became like huge slaves. After talking to some of my sisters, sorry, going on a tangent, but some of my sisters would would tell me how, they would just make meals all day long and clean up kitchens and make meals and clean up kitchens. And they were just slaves to Warren. And it was the end of days, right when before he got thrown in jail and the raid happened in Texas or what have you. They were just feared for their life that they were going to be, and if they didn't make it to Texas, they weren't going to make it to heaven. And, and I, I get their fear because I was there. I lived it. Their fears, their fears were real. Mm-hmm. It was scary. I'm sure they were terrified. But yeah, I don't know why. Went off on that one. <laughs> but I did love hearing about his family and about the things that they did and the fun, like the cool. I love going back to the place. He takes me there all the time. They have the, most fantastic park I've ever seen in my life. It's huge. Before Warren was there, it was all about family. It was all about togetherness and being one as a, as a group, as a united, united effort plan. That's really what, you know, you see it on there. Um, you see UEP on the rocks down there. That's what that is, united effort plan. That's kind of what we strive for until Warren got in there. Then it was all just a twisted little. Obviously, some of the things were shocking. There, there's plenty of that, like not being able to ever talk to girls or look at them. <laughs> He'll tell you, tell him about how you flirted. That's a fun one. Oh. 
I'm going to flirt with you. Ready? Oh. <laughs> we had bad our eyes. And they, we have to be quick, though. You got to be quick. Oh. Someone will catch you. You'll get busted. And if you're, you're caught flirting with another man's wife, you're dead. Uh-oh. You know, the, God's going to strike you down. So some of those things, and obviously the things that I have already, like the dresses and I mean, you can't talk to anybody outside of your family. Because when you, how do you learn how to flirt? How do you even learn how to communicate, really? Because these women, they get married to these guys, you know, just like my mom's. They get, get married to my dad. They didn't know him. They never met him before. Really? They just get assigned. Warren just picks them for you. Okay. Did they meet on the wedding day? Yeah. Before they had computers, well, yeah, so you live in the same town, the ones that lived in the same town, but we had groups in Idaho, we had groups in Salt Lake, all over Salt Lake, actually, because of that's kind of where everything started. And then there was the big group in Colorado City, then there was a group in Canada. The Texas thing came later. That's when Warren took rain and decided he needed to move everybody out. If you didn't get to know her in your own little town, if you haven't seen her before, um, if she came from a different town, you never met her before. You didn't even know it's who you're. So they would send buses up to Canada, take some of the women down. So they would, I don't know, like cattle, you know, if you you breed the same one, it, you get like. Deformities, yeah. Yep. You'd be like, what's his name? Kingston Group. Yeah, that one. Or what was yes. that? King Tut? Is that who his oh, name? Oh, that that's why he died because they were. Yep. King Tut, they, he was a. That's how he died. I don't know if it was like once a year, but during Harvest Fest, that's when we would have like all the women come from either they'd send a bus down here with a bunch of men in it too, and they would take wives back with them. So we'd just like do like a, a, a girl swap, I guess. But how they would do it, we'd had our Harvest Fest. Um, that's what we'd call it. It's basically like a farmer's market, what have you. But the whole t- town gets together and makes and just has a a barbecue outside and, and does plays and, and hangs out. This is before Warren. Mm-hmm. And then all the women would come down, get married to some of the men. And then that same bus would load back up with women and go back to Canada and marry all the women, all the dudes up there. Okay. That's how they kind of kept the population from being too incest, you know, thinking back on it. But at the time it was, it was an awesome thing. Cause then if you're, sister got bust up there then you would have connections up there and and be able to talk to to different people you know um back then they didn't have really cell phones or anything like that we had pagers and landlines so did that happen to some of your sisters nope okay they didn't get it no. <laughs> <laughs> how many siblings did you have from your mom so we we thought we had 32 but i think we only had 28 and then we end up with 26 because there was a couple a twin that died and a couple of stale burns, something like that. Oh, okay. So, wow, that's a lot between two mothers. Two moms, yeah. Two Ooh. sisters. Where were you wives. in... Right. That's another important point. They were both sisters, like actual sisters yeah. and sister wives. Yeah. So, where were you in the lineup of kids in the age? I had number six. To- out of both wives? So, my mom was married first. Okay. I think my second mom didn't get married to him until two other kids. So I was I was born before she got there, before the second mom got there. Okay. What was your opinion like when another woman comes into the picture? Were you jealous or No, so I was I was really young. I was probably barely born. Oh so I didn't okay. know any different my whole life growing up. I'm sure my other brothers might be might have a little different opinion on it, but I'm sure they loved it actually, because then you got more time with mom, you know, because we, we, we knew who our birth mom was. Obviously we call her mom and then the other ones were mother and then their name. That was fun. <laughs> we didn't never get our third one though. Did you feel like your other mother took care of you well and she treated the other children yeah. like, like her own? Mm-hmm. That's what I, you know, I hear all these different stories from uh, other people. I'm like, Oh man, we just didn't get, get that. Our family was pretty tight knit and, we didn't see other than we knew who our, when we were growing up, once you got over and started working, you didn't see a difference. You know, other than you, of course, you still have your bond with your, with your mom, right? And not like the other mother. I hear about some of the other families that didn't like jive like ours. It was kind of weird. Like, oh, we all get along. What do you guys? Yeah. You guys have different parents and you have different moms and you guys separate that way, kind of. Yeah. Have the little, 
some of my um, uncle's wives would separate their kids from the other kids as, from the other wives' kids. And you guys lived in the same home? Yeah. Our house was uh, an apartment complex, not an apartment, uh, a hotel. hotel. So my dad bought a hotel. I don't know where he got it from. And then cut it all up and then bring the pieces back and put it on a foundation. And, and that's where we lived, in a, in a hotel. Wait, he took apart an entire hotel, moved it, and reassembled a hotel somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. We did that a lot, actually. What? Like I did. I went down to California and disassembled some of the military base. And you, if you went walk through Colorado City, there's... There's all these houses that look the same. They're like square boxes with a roof on top. They're all military bases that I disassembled in California and put on a ship or on a um, a ship, <laughs> on a, a truck uh-huh. and sent it here. And another crew would put it together. I think I put together one, but I didn't do any more than that. That is wild. But there's a lot of them that are like that. I'm trying to imagine what it would be like. I I feel like it might be kind of fun. Like the whole family it have in their own separate rooms? Well, no, we weren't separate. We had six people in a room. Six. <laughs> okay, so this wasn't a huge hotel. <laughs> it was like how many uh, rooms were in this hotel? So each wing, my dad took apart one of the rooms and made it just a master with a, oh. a door in front of it. So you know how like hotels have the hall right down the center? Yeah. And there's room on opposite sides of the, on the, hallway. Of the hallway. So we had... One, two, three, four, five. It's seven of them, I think. I probably could call my sister. She'll probably correct me. But one of them was on each side of the the house was the mother's suite, where he made one of the rooms into a big room. It took the closet out of it and and made it and took the bathroom out of it and made it a bigger room, and then just used the restroom of the other. Um, room across the street as part of that thing. So that would be the master's restroom. It would be the other hotel room. And that's how both... The house is torn down now, and I know why. It was nasty. Really? It didn't hold up? No, it didn't hold up at all. Oh, man. But we didn't know any different. It was it was home. It was beautiful. I loved it. Yeah. You know, that was that's the crazy thing. People talk about all the crazy things that happened. I'm like, oh, I remember how much we loved each other and how much I loved being around my cousins. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm sure glad I didn't get all that. I didn't get all the Warren Jeffs. I left it a good time. That's so great to hear. And so I have a hard question for you, and I'm sure it's going to be a complicated answer. But in your opinion, if Warren Jeffs hadn't taken over and kind of made it very authoritarian and abusive, honestly, do you think that the polygamous lifestyle would have been a healthy place to raise kids? I think they'd still be thriving right now. They are nothing like there. There's a few strands of um, people that have made a lot of money off of our backs, right? That the pocketed all the money that Warren Jess was supposed to be getting because he's in jail now. So they're, and, and they're still throwing, my dad's still throwing money to Warren right now. So all those guys have like started their own little things. But if Warren Jess wouldn't have gotten the mix, I think it would be a huge community. I think we were building a house in a day. That's how tight knit we were. You can go online and find the house in a day. I don't know who posted it, but I'm glad they did. It was kind of cool. That was part of that house. We built it in one damn day. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay if you Swore curse. <laughs> it's okay. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. So you having grown up in it and having left, do you feel like looking back that it was still a healthy environment for you to grow up in or any kid to grow up in? Before Warren, I think it would have been, after you know, seeing how corrupt the world is really right now, it actually isn't a bad, it wouldn't have been a bad spot with him, other than obviously the the wives situation. But how I grew up, it was, it was, it was awesome. Interesting. Yeah, we, we loved, we loved our other mom and we loved our, our um, yeah, the other mother, right? Uh-huh. Obviously loved your own mom more. But it would have been fine if one just wanted to screw the whole thing up. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure someone else would have got their little perverted mind in there. And yeah. It would, I don't think it was just one. I'm sure there was a lot of other old men that were getting their, their corrupted little minds in there and trying to come Even up Even his dad had how many wives? It was already getting corrupted. Yeah. So the, 
if I, if you look back on how, um, so I guess I'd have to take that back. I guess it wouldn't probably be thriving. Um, if you look back at it, people that made the most money and contributed the most, that's, I'm sure that's why dad gave all his money when we crash, but that already, that ship has sailed. They needed money now because they were getting sued by everybody in every corner. Hmm. So all the people that had like big businesses and big, uh, companies, what have you, that were pulling a lot of money and paying a lot of tithing, they got more wives. Okay. They all got their three wives for sure. Everybody that was rich got their three wives because they were, they were, they were paying the money. They were keeping Warren's back pocket fat. So he kept, he kept them happy. Do you recall how many wives Rulon had before he died? No, he had a lot though. It says it in that documentary because Warren took his oh, moms. moms as wives. And it says it in that, um, Keep sweet. Keep sweet. Pray and obey or something like that. Yeah. Is it that one? I think it's another one. They it had, was a lot. He had close 100. to 80 or something like that or 100 someone, someone by the time, it. by the time he married all his moms, it was, it was pretty nutty. I'm like, but the thing about the, uh, Warren's and Ruland's moms. So what we were always told is where we're going to get lifted up and lifted off this world. Uh, and then the world, all you wicked people, we're going to get burned up because you know, the world is going to get baptized by fire. Mm hmm. Right. And well, there's another story of another uh, group of people that got lifted off this world. I forget what it was, but Nephites or something like that. I don't know who they are. Lamanites, maybe. Like they got lifted Mormon off the story. world. But we were going to be, yeah, we were getting, we were going to get lifted off the world with them. And uh, the world was going to get baptized by fire. And we were going to get sent back down in Zion in, uh, in paradise. I don't know where they said back east or something like that. No, it was right in like, Missouri, isn't it? They had a specific. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's probably it. That's probably it. Something like that. I think so. It's the same. Yeah, it's the same. It was the same it's for us. The same. He knew more scripture than I did by far, and my family. When we watched the Bible stories together, Ben knew all the Bible stories because mm. he studied them well, his whole life. Real. He's very versed in all the Bible stories and. Yeah, I remember hearing that too. By the time you were well, you had to read it, the Book of Mormon three times, and if you couldn't, they would you'd have to read it to somebody three times. Whoa! It was nutty. The Book of Mormon is not easy to get through. I will say, I've uh, fallen asleep many a night reading the Book of Mormon <laughs> to try and be a good little Mormon kid. Um, yeah, I remember the apocalyptic teachings, but they weren't so extreme, I guess. I don't know. What do you think, Wendy? Do you feel like there was a, a big emphasis on the latter days? I mean, it's Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but did you really feel like it was an apocalyptic church growing up in? I didn't because I don't think I listened enough. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, it might have been. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it could have been. But I didn't pay attention enough. That's so interesting. <laughs> I was just there. Yeah, I remember that being, I mean, that was Joseph Smith's whole thing is it's the latter days and Christ is going to come back any second and marry up all these people and do the righteous thing and become a Mormon so that you don't get burned in fire, which is really terrifying as a child to think about. So I want to go back to the community and how it seemed like you had a great childhood. You enjoyed it. You were working, which is not great working that young, but it was way better. So we loved it. Like all of us boys that we would go out and build, we loved it. So during school, we would um, we'd have to do Warren Jeff scripture. We had to do it was it wasn't school. You were, you were drilled about the religion again and again during your school. So you're just like, I'd way rather work. Right. Right. I don't want to have to be drilled on this anymore. I don't want to, have to hear the same thing over and over again. So to go and work was actually a privilege. And how I got my dad to get me out. I'd like, we, we grew up really poor, but we, we loved it. We still loved each other. Um, and I told him, like, hey, that's how I got him to get me to go work. Mike, wouldn't it be better if I served the priesthood and got, went and got a job and helped pay for bills at home? Oh, yeah. That'd be a good idea. You know, that's what my dad's saying. Um, I went to work and I was like, whew, no more than, because like every day, every single day, and as soon as you work, wake up, you go to morning prayer and then you go to 
breakfast, and then you go to another damn thing. So if it, this is how our school went, it's how the school day went for my three years. Actually, I went to uh, a couple years in in Colorado City, so I guess that's who I'm re- what I'm referring to. Or re- referring to, we would um, go after breakfast, go to another church. I don't forget. We probably call that morning prayer as well, but whatever. And then you go back, get ready for school, and then go to school, and then they'd have another prayer at school where they would read a scripture again, and then you'd finally start learning your ABCs, one, two, threes, which was Warren's handwritten books that he'd come out with of what was appropriate to teach your children. Then after that, you'd have lunch and then they'd have another prayer at lunch and do another scripture and another thing. It was, it was, it was too much. Yeah. It was like, oh, yes, I will go work because I, you don't get drink soda. You don't need doing that. But if you went work, you could drink soda and you could, um, go eat out at restaurants. You know, not, this was before Warren took power. So we could still eat at restaurants. Yeah, that makes total sense. It was great. We loved it. We're like, heck yeah, get to go out and work with my cousins and do fun things. That's great. Sure, work is hard, but whatever, it was a lot. It was all mindset. My question then is, how did the money work? So were you able to get paid directly from the people you were building homes for? Were you able to pocket that? Did you have to give it all to someone else and they divvied it out somehow? So how my family worked, like I found out other people didn't do this. That was one of the things I'm like, well, our family was hardcore. We would give 100% of our money to our dad. We didn't keep a dime. Mm. So even though we worked from the time we were seven, we didn't keep him our money. And we, we were glad to do it. Um, we truly were until, until earlier, until later in life. I'm like, oh, I can go buy me some cool stuff. Or I can go do this. You know, With my own money, I would get advances from people I'm working from. I'd be like, hey. You give me an advance and you're like, what do you need it for? I just need to go get some lunch. So I get like 50 bucks for a weekend. And you thought you were a millionaire. Like, sweet. But we were making, I was pulling some pretty good numbers back then for um, how young I was. I was making a lot of money for the time. You know, obviously our inflation's gone down like crazy, but whatever. You're up. And you said that you had your own crew by the time you were 16 years old. So if you could drive, you got to be the crew captain. So by the time I was 16, I could drive. So I would take, I would take my uncle's truck and go pick up all my cousins. That was, it was great. I would pick all my cousins up. We'd dart to St. George. I'd build a house, but we had a little code we all lived by and everybody knew it. <laughs> if we seen anybody watching us, we, so we'd have people kind of watching as you're working. Cause you know, people are watching us anyways. Cause we're, we're fully clothed in the middle of the desert. Yeah. You know, we look weird. No, I didn't know how weird we look till you get out, right? Yeah. But so people will be watching us all the time anyways. But if you've seen like a car park for too long, we were all supposed to roll our tools up, throw them in the trailer and go home. So, well, because we, they were smart. They're like, all you kids are all underage. Right. If OSHA or somebody shows up, they're going to shut us down. So That's what I was going to say. There wasn't an, uh, an adult there to manage us. We were all just kids. But we felt like, we felt like adults. You had 16 we and were God's under. God's chosen children. 16 and under building full on <laughs> houses and no one said anything. Yeah, but the Lord was protecting us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's what, that's what we, we truly thought that we, I was incredible. Like the bravery that that, that power gave you because you were God's chosen children. And so we would walk these crazy buildings and just run around like, I don't know how we didn't all die. We would just jump across buildings and, and just build as fast as we could. And no one ever died because we were God's chosen children. We didn't have any fear. So it probably made it better because if you're up on top of these massive buildings as a young kid, you know, that'd be nutty to see my son up there right now, but. <laughs> I can imagine them doing any of the crap I did. But, <laughs> like I'm putting up full on houses at 16 and, you know, me and my cousin were doing, I was like, oh man, my, my son is the same age as when I was crew captain. And now how do you feel about it? Yeah. I'm like, oh, <laughs> no way. Right. You had this great childhood, it seemed. And of course there were restrictions and things that weren't ideal now that you can look back at it. But because... I mean, you you left. So what was it that was the catalyst for you to realize that you didn't want to be a part of the FLDS anymore? 
the people, you know, cause I worked and I got to know people outside in the real world. And there was this one time when I was, uh, where were we working? It was between Vegas and, um, St. George or Mesquite. There's a little town off there. We were actually building someone a castle. It was pretty crazy. The house we were building, but I was in the basement. And we were working late. So we had to finish this house because we, we were living out of our truck. We, we drove from Colorado City to this place early in the morning and we're trying to finish it up by night. So we're working. It's like 10 or so at night and it's in the desert. And I'm, I have like, I'm just a little kid with chappy lips, super chappy lips. Not ripping the skin off my mm. um, lips and doing this and doing anything to get them moisturized. And then some girl, Bring me some chapstick. It was used. I didn't care. I grabbed that chapstick, put it on my, looked at her like, oh, well, hell, you're not evil. You know? Yeah. You know, that was kind of an aha moment. I'm like, no, you, you cared enough to go get this for me. I never even said nothing because we can't talk to anybody, right? I never even said boo to them. They've come out and looked at us a couple of times. I'm sure we looked funny to them on our full get up, but they would, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was nice to see that there was nice people out in this world. And, and, you know, that was just, that's just one story. And you would get going to restaurants because I could go to restaurants before Warren took power. And obviously I wasn't there when he took 100% control and we could meet people. And I started working at the gas station in Colorado City and I got to meet a lot of people, even the Gentiles are in the apostates that, you know, that we call them that left the church mm-hmm. would come in there and, and still treat me nice and say hello. And they weren't like we were taught, right? They weren't like evil and trying to steal us from our parents or that's what you're taught. You're taught you're going to get, if you, if someone else, like you'll see the fear in some of these kids' eyes and I know it. Um, I know what they're taught. So I was like, I just leave them alone. I want to go and put, even though I still want to go see these kids, you know, after you, you're like, Oh no, this, this, we're not evil. But to go say that to them would be like even worse because they know who you are or their parents would tell you, oh, yeah, that guy, he turned his back against the prophet. Mm -hmm. But just find out that there's not, everybody's not evil out here. Sure, there is, right? But it's not like we were taught. When you lived, when I lived in St. George, you could see they would go to Walmart and Sam's Club and you could see, you know, the kids and the moms walking through shopping. They would never pick their eyes up. They looked at the ground. And would never look at you. Well, the moms and the kids are not supposed to talk to anybody. If if someone approaches you, you go get your priesthood head, which is your dad, or um, if you're with one of your uncles and you go get him, or you go get your brother who holds the priesthood and have them talk to him. The kids or the wives are never allowed to talk to uh, outsiders. Yeah, and that brings up a good point because a lot of times in the comments, people ask, how can I help these people get out if they want to get out or how can I tell them like and I think you illustrated it so perfectly just simple acts of kindness to show them hey we're we're okay out here we do care and do you have any other suggestions you gotta you you gotta do it secretly though I don't know if I could have accepted I don't think my uncle knew that I took the chapstick or anything like that because he might have thought it was of the devil right Mm -hmm. because these people are not part of our church Mm -hmm. but I just right there put it on I'm like oh thank you you know I was dying all day long she watched me lick my lips and it's the worst (laughs) so just something like that just a small act of kindness can be a turning point it wasn't even new I you know it was just oh there are also homes outside that I don't know if there's a lost boys home anymore no there used to be when Ben left Ben you can tell them about the home that you helped start. So I left, right? And Warren took power probably, I don't know, right after it was just 2000 when I left. You know, a lot of crazy things happened in the year 2000 because, you know, the, world, the computers were all supposed to shut down. Mm-hmm. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we're going to try to get the lost, how, where are the lost boys and how you can help? I think that in Utah, they help them a lot if you can go. Don't there's a to... there's a place called Cherish Families that takes care of a lot of the, and it's not so much the boys. I mean, sure we got a lot of the the media's eye because so when I was in St. George before, right after, right before I met you, we had this place called the Lost the Lost Boys House, and we would take the boys from Colorado City because obviously I couldn't afford to take care of them. So a bunch of the rich people in uh, St. George, I could name drop, but I ain't getting. 
<laughs> um, they bought this house. They, they put food in it. They put um, refrigerators in it and stocked it. It was like Christmas. This place was always loaded with food. And we had like 14 kids in there. I don't know how it all worked out, but we always found a home for them. Like shortly after someone would adopt, not adopt, but like take one of these kids in. And then that room would get filled again. And then someone else would come and get another kid. And that room would get filled again. It was, it was pretty cool. And it was, it was fun to be a part of. And all the boys, you know, cause we all worked in construction. It was a piece of crap house, but you know, it got bit, bought for us. So we remodeled it. It made it nice. Mm. I think the Mormon church is actually the one that, um, funded the food for the place. Oh, interesting. For the longest time. They, they would come over and drop off groceries, like a ton of groceries. I'm like, dang, you kids are eating better than me, you know, because <laughs> I, I had my own place, but I helped them build this house and help the kids all move in there. And a lot of my brothers lived there. So I was there. Um, so we had to have an adult there in order to keep the, the house. I don't, know what, I don't know how the government let us do it, but they let us do it. So we had to have an adult there 24 seven, someone that was over 18. So I would go volunteer and my cousins would volunteer. And they would all live there in that house after, uh, I don't know what, it, the crash in 2007 and 8, it kind of went away because all the, you know, the rich people kind of went belly up, what have you. But then the house went away and miraculously, a lot of good people came up and took the kids. Hmm. Like we had 14 kids that just, I didn't keep track of where they went, but they all ended up in a good home. I've met most of them all um, since then and they all have really cool stories to tell after they left the house Wow! of someone else acts of kindness, you know, things that we were taught, learned out here. That's amazing. So tell us a little bit about when you escaped, what that was like, how you actually went about doing it. <laughs> I got in a fight with my dad. No, <laughs> <laughs> no. So I, I, I told you earlier, I think that I left, um, twice. Mm -hmm. So I left once with one of my, um, buddies that we were doing bad things with, things that we shouldn't be doing as kids. And we left and went and stayed at his brother's house. They lived in St. George. I wasn't 18 at the time. So my dad, I took my dad's card there. We both drove over to his, it was a trailer house with a bunch of smokers and drinkers in it. And I can imagine what little boys did when they left the creek. <laughs> mm -hmm. Fill in the blanks yourself. But anyways, my dad ended up calling because he knew who I left with because he wasn't I mean, we think we're invincible, like our parents don't know anything. But the town, everybody like in the town knows each other. So they've seen me and the and my friend leave in the car. There's people that are watching that town all the time. Little did I know that there was all these little spies everywhere. Until I found out later. <laughs> we find out the hard way. They found out where I was and got in contact with the the lady, which was, you know, a Gentile that had married this um my friend's brother and she was like oh no you're under 18 this guy's threatening to throw me in jail blah 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 you just have to leave i'm sorry you can come back you only got like another another eight or nine months and you can leave i was like huh we already had i already had a job figured out i was going to work on monday but i was like well you know what i don't know because you're, you're you're scared still right so i mm -hmm. went back after 18 i got to a an argument with my dad and i already was going to leave because I had pre-planned it with my another cousin. We were out in the, the field and we drew it all out on the, the dirt, how we were going to ride our bikes down to my brother's house because he had left before me and live with my brother. We were going to get on our one speed bikes, you know, the little ones that jump and ride. I don't remember how many miles it is from Colorado City to St. George, but it's a lot. But wait, we were going to do it. We had it all, but you couldn't like draw anything on a piece of paper. So that's what we had to do on the dirt. Why couldn't you draw on the paper? Someone will find it and then show your plans to your dad. Ah. Oh. So like if you would write in your, um, your diary or something like that, your dad would read that and then he'd figure out what you're thinking. <laughs> so we, we got smart. We didn't write anything down. If we, we had a little paper somewhere that had our little, um, escape plan on it, we'd be in trouble. So we had to write it down in the dirt and then we just both memorized what we were going to do. And, but that never happened. That never turned out. So how, how I left <laughs> <laughs> was <laughs> we, we went to bed after that and we forgot about our, 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 Cause it wasn't written plan. down. 
<laughs> yeah, we didn't have it written down. We had it on the dirt. We, like, we kept putting this on paper. We'd be in trouble. <laughs> but I, I had bought a truck since then with my tithing money. So we didn't keep our money, right? We had to, uh, we, we got our, we got 10%. And dad always give us more than a 10% for tithing because he always paid more than 10%. This, this dang guy lived way more by Warren's role than any of his other brothers. It was crazy. So I would take my tithing and so you'd have, you know, a fat stack of cash. So say it's five grand, right? And you needed, you knew how many ones and stuff. So I would go get like 20 or so ones and put some fives and maybe put a hundred in there and then take the rest and save it. And then go give Warren my $5,000, write $5,000 on there with stars and stuff on it and give him my tithing. I bet he thought, you poor sucker, you don't know how to read after he's seen all those ones. Or you don't know how to count, right? Mm. <laughs> but that's how I got my truck. We'll get to this story. That's how I got my truck to uh, to finally leave as I would I would take my tithing money. I still pay my tithing. Just would look like I was ain't got no education, ahead. right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I bought my truck and with my tithing. And I, my dad was, we were in argument. I don't know what we were arguing about, but I pushed him down. And I feel shitty about it now. At the time, you you think you're macho man, but now I'm like, oh, why did why is that my last moment that I've ever talked to my dad? Mm. Right, and that is, I think that's the last time we actually talked. No, take that back. He's we've talked because um, I rescued most of all his kids from him. We've talked a few times since then. Mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not, but that was for the longest time. That was my last moment I've ever ever talked to my dad. I was like, oh, that's kind of shitty. That's the last time I talked to him, but. I've seen him since then. I think he's forgiven me for it. I never felt good about it. I'll say that, Dad. If you see this, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so you take the truck. Yeah, so I took the truck and moved to my um, my brother's house. My dad had called my brother before I even got there because we got in a fight, right? He knew my plan. I, I thought it was pretty secretive. No, he knew exactly where I was going. <laughs> went to my, before I got to my brother's house in St. George, dad had called my brother and told him, if you um, take Van in, um, I won't let you see any other family members. I won't let you see mom. I won't let you see anybody. You'll be shunned from ours for Jeez. life. So I get there and he's like, you can't, you can't stay here, dude. I'm like, no. What do you mean? Because I've already like talked to him a couple of times before that, you know, because we were secret. You know, we would, I just don't know how I got his phone number, but I'd call him every so often. And he said, I couldn't stay with you. And so I was like, well, that sucks. How oh, I jumped in my truck and went and lived in my truck for a while, for like three or four months, just slept in the back of my truck. Just because like, once you're in construction, you know everybody and everybody knows you'll work. So I got a job doing cabinets and I was living in my truck. And one of the, how do you call them? Call them apostates because they're out in Centennial. But the hugest hearts, like when thinking back about all these people that helped me out, it's, it's crazy. I, you know, I, I owe a lot to these guys and I always thought such little of them because mm-hmm. they were, they knew what was right and then they turned their back against it. And we were always taught they were just the lesser of less, you know, like. Centennials the, live on the other side of on the, the other road. side of the freeway from Colorado City. Anyways, these guys, <laughs> they took me and gave me jobs and it was like a group of a family members of, I don't want to say their names, but they all took me and each one of them gave me a job. And that's where I lived. I lived in some other, I didn't know it was their brothers. So the guy I was working for, his brother let me live it in their house, just on a couch that was on the side of a hallway instead of living in my truck. They let me sleep there for a, for a while. And then I moved to my, my buddy Kevin's house and lived in his, um, so I was actually friends with his younger brothers. He he had moved out, went to Alpha Valley, and then moved in, stayed in his. Uh, they had an old camp trailer. I have no way would stay in a camp trailer nowadays. Not a chance. <laughs> that place had there was bugs on the walls, and I would just squish them. I remember that. I'm like, oh man, I had no way would sleep like that. Now I couldn't get comfortable. There ain't yeah. a chance. But that's where I lived, and I loved it. I felt so free and so alive. It was it was insane. And that's why when I hear everybody else get their crazy stories, I'm like, oh, mine wasn't like that. I, I felt freedom. I felt release. I felt awesome. Yeah. I felt like a million bucks. I don't know. When you, when you get out, it's, it's such a, such a high. I guess that's a better way to explain it. 
once you, once you leave that place, the rush that you get every day when you wake up and you're not there, you're like, Oh, this is all me. I can do whatever I want. You know, my brother Adam told me that when I first left, it's like, well, the world is yours now, Ben. I'm like, what are you talking about? You can be whatever you want to be. You want to go be a doctor? You want to go be this? You want to go be an astronaut? You can do whatever you want. I was like, huh? It was just that aha moment. You know, it's, it's awesome. The feeling that I got was, was crazy awesome. It was crazy exciting. And, you know, I went to work and started getting, start, um, we obviously went to, got in a couple of rental places and, uh, met a girl and we got it. We built, I got two houses. By the time I was 25, I owned two homes. What? And it was on top of the world. I had a, I had three cars. I had four wheelers. I had everything. It was, it was crazy at such a young age to think, like, damn, my, my kids, I don't know if they could even achieve that. I, I hope they can, right? But I hope I can give them some ump and to go get that. But that's crazy. Yeah. Where was I going with this? So yeah, that's how I escaped, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then I went to college after, a, so then 2007 or whatever, after the Lost Boys thing um, ended, all the, you know, the economy collapsed and all the, you know, the, the funding left for the house. Mm-hmm. I also lost my homes as well. And I ended up bringing up with the girl that I was with and then went back to college. And that's where I met this hottie. And then. <laughs> <laughs> Did you meet at Dixie? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Dixie State. Wow. Right. Like three days before I was moving back up north. Wow. Okay. So before we bring Wendy into this, because I'm super pumped, I just want to know one thing. What was the hardest adjustment that you had to face now that you had the big wide world in front of you to do whatever you wanted? What's the adjustments you had to make? The um, biggest adjustment. As far as like my life or, or, uh, yeah, just like now that you don't have anyone telling you when to wake up, when to eat, how to do certain things, how to flirt, what's something that you found was the most difficult where you were like, wow, how do I do this? Figure out how to flirt. No. <laughs> that was the biggest adjustment. The, the, the blinking thing did not work. <laughs> the blinking. <Yeah. laughs> Wendy, had he figured out how to flirt by the time he met you? <laughs> no, I took the blinking. It was fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Free free now. <laughs> you just had to take off his shirt. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> She's like sold construction guy. So <laughs> yeah, what was that like? How did you first meet? How did you fall mm-hmm. in love? What's your love story? Yeah. So a girl I played soccer with at Dixie was dating his brother. They went bowling together once. I wasn't there, but then they decided. Or she thought that I would. She like invited him. you. She invited us over. Yeah, so she invited us over to my house. Okay. Or invited him over, and her, his brother actually left. She left. And she back. wanted him. <laughs> <laughs> it was so kind of like kinda a weird. polygamous situation for, for a, a minute. <laughs> yeah, it ended up being that <laughs> overnight. I, <laughs> luckily, I like forced my way into the middle because we were uh-huh. sleeping outside on a mattress. <laughs> Under the stars. You gotta say the mattress part. You're under the stars. So I snuck myself into the middle in between them. And yeah, that was that. Oh my gosh, I love that. You're (laughs) like, I'm gonna claim this guy. This is my man. Scoot over. (laughs) Yeah, and then I moved back to Salt Lake three days later. So we ended up just, he would drive down like every other weekend or I would drive his way. And then I ended up moving in with him. When I moved in with him, he lived, he was in St. George still, and all of the brothers that had left were in Alaska at the time um, fishing. No, so they oh, got it. Building. They were building an army base, actually, is what yeah, they were building. Yeah, they were building an army base in Alaska. And it, it had gotten over like maybe a couple weeks after I had moved in, and all of them came back. So we all were all close, we're all tight. We I lived together. Know them. I knew his family. So there would just be bodies all over the floor. I can't even tell you. There was probably 10 kids. And then our cousins would come over too and, and pass out on the floor. There are so many brothers just sitting there. And I couldn't tell them apart. I always called oh. them by the wrong name. Oh, they my all gosh. Look, even coming from another mother, they all look the same. Oh, wow. It was crazy. When they all came back, I didn't. What is this? Yeah. 
There's 10 of you. (laughs) And you still loved him so much that you were like, okay, I can deal with this. Yeah. They, they made jokes all the time. Like his brother introduced himself and his twin sister. They look like twins now, him and his brother that introduced him as a twin, but his sister, because, well, they came from the same mom, Mm -hmm. but they're very close in age. And they really do look at the time looked very, very similar. So I just thought they were twins forever until finally Ben was like, no, they're, they're two years <laughs> apart. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. So, so for like the longest time, I didn't know their names. I tried really hard, but you know, she would have read the book of Mormon. She could have. <laughs> if I would have read the book of Mormon, <laughs> you know, all the names are in there. So. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. I think I'm out of the Bible. Yeah. yeah. So, Wendy, because you didn't grow up in this FLDS situation, you were familiar with Mormonism, but clearly it's a lot more extreme in the FLDS. And now you are helping all of these people escape from the community and taking them in and showing them the world. What was that like for you? Uh, for the most part, it was great. I loved having the new faces in the house. They're fresh into the world. So there's a lot of things that they don't le- learn in the religion. Um, that we kind of had to just fill in the blanks. Mm-hmm. Um, some knew more than others. So we just kind of had to get a feel for each kid that came out and um, help them get into the world. Um, some were, didn't get a lot of worldly time before they came to us. So when they're taught there, you know, you, you don't look at people, you don't speak to people, we are evil. And it's hard for them to turn that around. And so we just had to ease our way in and try to help them get some jobs and Mm. ease our way into the world, even offering some therapy and, and that and did our best to just help them get into the real world and understand that people aren't not all people are evil. Yeah. I'm sure most of it was just a perspective shift. Definitely. Like Ben, you were talking about just the just getting over the us versus them mentality and demonizing the rest of the world. And also I know that I mean personally, I know that being part of the quote one true church creates a superiority complex, almost like well, we got it figured out, you guys don't. And that can also create some issues as far as just really learning who you are without the religion, because once that comes crashing down, it almost takes your entire identity with it. And you're just trying to figure out, what do I even believe? Who am I? What are my hobbies now? Because I've been told what to do and how to do it. Did you find that a lot of what you were doing was helping them come into themselves as people? Definitely. Even just the little things, like I said before, the swimming was just incredible to watch because they were seriously like little children jumping into the pool, just They're jumping God's in, <laughs> God's children, <laughs> jumping in off the side of the pool, doing a little flip and they'd come up and just be so excited. And you just don't see that mm-hmm. in older kids because, you know, we get to swim, but for them, it was like these little joys that we got to see come out. They didn't know who they were. They didn't know what they liked. So those little things that they enjoyed was it was really fun to watch. Yeah, I'm sure that was really rewarding, even just taking them out to eat in restaurants if they've never been before. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And bringing them around family who's so loving and, you know, just yeah, family took, took in, helped us take in. Right. And giving them jobs and, you know, just showing them that, you know, there isn't just pure evil out here. Mm-hmm. There's There's more to it. Would you say that they were mostly boys, the lost boys who you were taking in? Yeah. Oh, yeah. For the most part, yeah. I don't Definitely. know that we, we didn't seek anybody out and go do the, the rescue mission. We They just, I don't know, it always ended up landing in our laps. They ended up with Ben, I think, or with us because Ben had access to jobs. So if anybody reached out to family, they would always say, oh, Ben, Ben can help you. Because Ben was in the construction community and knew the outside world better so he could get them jobs or they could come work with him. Yeah. Ben, can you explain just in a little bit more detail why why it's easier for boys to leave? I mean, I think it's kind of obvious, but I really want to paint the picture as to why they don't really want the women to leave or don't let them. 
you know, obviously they want the women there because they need, they need the wives, but it's harder for a woman to leave because, and I'm not one, obviously, and I'm, and I'll just quote this off of hearing what my sisters had to say is they never got the outside world like we got. We got to go out and work and actually talk to other human beings, right? Where they were only talking to priesthood, priesthood men, priesthood leaders, you know, in their, in the FLDS. Mm-hmm. So they never got that, the social cues and they never got the, the interaction. Um, so there, that was a big, huge one. Just learning how to communicate, um, is huge. And sure, there's a lot of smart, um, girls out there that can communicate just fine, right? But, um, they could probably do a lot better if they were not so socially awkward. Yeah. But, and I feel like the whole not knowing who you are or knowing your worth when you come out, because in the religion, you, you know, you're this prize. You're given to this man and you're going to be sent to heaven. And then when you leave, it's like, oh, what am I now? Mm. We'll find out who you are. And I feel like when they left, it was more of a push. We got more phone calls. We got more pushback from the community of trying to get them back when we took the women or the the girls out. For the men, it, we didn't, I don't really remember getting phone calls. Or yeah, so we never, back. I don't know that we ever did the, like on the, Netflix series where they did the rescues on that. We never did that. Escaping polygamy. Yeah. Yeah. We never did any of that. They, they didn't come to us. We didn't go and rescue them or anything like that. We would just, we'd be like, Hey, come live with us. Like, okay. Didn't go run out and, uh, we'll give you a job, cause a scene and, and try to tell somebody off. We, they found their own ways out. We yeah. just got them after the fact to help them back into the world. How many at one time would you say you usually had kind of in and out of your house? Most of the time we only had one. Okay. But mm-hmm. when I was with him in the very beginning, when lived. they all came back from Alaska, they all lived together. There was probably 10 of them yeah, at just- least. It was very bizarre. <laughs> yeah. When else, yeah, I could see how that'd be hard to be like, oh, what the heck? And people There's everywhere. Sleeping- and every they were everywhere. And Ben, you're like, I'm used to living with 28 siblings. What are yeah. you talking about? <laughs> yeah. There was this little walkway where like we had three bedrooms. So it went up the stairs. There was a walkway and then, like the three bedrooms. And there was like two kids sleeping out there. I knew where they were. I didn't know where they were. <laughs> this is true. But that was bizarre. But after that. I, mean, I loved it. We I remember have- we had a conversation about this and we're like, you know, what are we going to do after this? You know, our lives are all going to change after this. And they were going to look back on this and go, oh, that would be kind of fun if we could all just have a big sleepover again. You know, all the, you know, all the family get back together and hang out. And, and we all, we all enjoyed each other's company. We would just barbecue in the backyard and it was because we were all free. Yeah. It was, it was great. Yeah. That is one thing. They never, there was never fighting yeah. unless it was just like brotherly funny fights, but. They all got along really well. It was a definitely a family oriented thing. It was just crazy to me that they all came home to one apartment. <laughs> mm-hmm. But after that, there was really maybe one or two in our house. I think at one point we had three. Yeah, probably. What was the general age gap or the age range, I guess, between all of them? So after I left, they had the big Lost Boys thing that was... It was big on the news at the time. So everybody knew about the Lost Boys or what have you. So I feel like um, a lot more people were leaving at that time. What, what, what was the big rush to leave? But there was a lot of boys leaving at, at one point in time. St. George was flooded with kids. It wasn't just our home that took in Lost Boys. I'm, there was generous people that also were behind the scenes taking these kids in. Mm. It wasn't just a few people that I knew. There was a lot more than what I knew. Um, that escaped and got placed with a family. And it's it was crazy. I think the youngest that we had was 13. Mm-hmm. 13 to 20. Okay. Or 20. I guess the girls were a little bit older. Okay, was, yeah, they might have been 20. The yeah. girls were a bit older. But the young ones came out, and that's the ones that got put in. Like somebody else took them on as well and got them put into high school. And yeah, they was, got to mm-hmm. experience that and actually go to school and graduate. To all the people that have helped out in that time, that was like a crazy time. time. You didn't realize how lucky we were to have everybody helping out. And when you when I was young like that, you didn't you didn't see what it really took to be able to um, help another human being. 
Like if you just go take in another, another person, that's a huge financial burden and it's a huge, right. you got to have a massive heart along, goes along with it. And there were plenty of people that didn't have the means to do it, but they took them in. They took in some of my family and it was crazy. And I went and met, I went and met them after they got placed in the home and I was like, Oh wow. I thought everybody that took someone in was stinking rich, but there were just some people with huge hearts that just took people in. They barely were surviving themselves and they know who they are. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was That's cool. amazing that you guys were able to do that and literally change so many people's lives. And now that you're in northern Utah instead of St. George and southern Utah, do you still get these phone calls? Are you still helping people escape? The younger ones, um, they experienced a whole lot different than what Ben did. So they called our younger siblings. So most of his... So it all worked out. So I only took like maybe... We only had like maybe 10 of them and then that all started going. They didn't know Ben. So they never even knew me before. Some oh. of the kids that. The kids that are leaving now never met Ben. I've never met right. them before. They, they were just being born, right? So they're calling the younger siblings. That they knew. Yeah. Because they're out and they have their. Which is good. Yeah. I think there's only two left in his family that haven't left. Yeah. Right. And for the most part, after um, Warren went to jail and the, the Texas raid and all that, where all the families got destroyed and, and thrown across the nation, they they kind of lost touch with Warren. And so a lot of them have just started their own life. And just like one of my sisters just started her own life and is off doing great. Didn't didn't um, require anybody to help her. She did it all herself. Hmm. It was awesome. It's awesome to see. That's amazing. Well, I want to know how you guys are doing now. I mean, I know, but tell everybody how you're doing now and what makes you happy and fulfilled and at peace. Go ahead. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so kind. <laughs> we have a great family. We've got four beautiful kids. That's what keeps us going. My family and his family, we're all very close. Go, go, go. Yeah, we go, go, go. We, we are basketball <laughs> soccer. <laughs> all those things that I never had, all my kids get to play. I'm like, I don't get to, I don't even know any of the rules. She knows them all, so that's good. He cheers really well. I can I can Aww. yell at my kids, but that's about it. I don't know the rules. I never played any of them. So, so like, here, come play. I'm like, I don't know all the rules. I'll be just like a big dude out there not doing anything. Oh, that's sweet. Well, Wendy knows. She was always the star athlete of the family. That's what's awesome to see all of our kids doing that. It's cool. Oh, that's awesome. Well, is there anything else you guys wanted to add or that you forgot to mention before we do our Linda Listen moment? I don't think so. Okay. Let's do our Linda Listen moment then. Sassy statement that you want to say to anyone who's pissed you off, or you can go an inspirational route. Linda Listen. <laughs> you never know what people have been through. Be kind. I love it. That's a good one. I know. I'd just like to say thanks to all the people that had uh, helped out with all the kids and um, the home that we put together and... Um, there are a lot of people I didn't mention that helped me out in my life and they know who they are and thank you. Yeah, that's amazing. And are you guys <laughs> familiar with holding out help that charity foundation? Yeah, that's a good one too. And cherish families and what else? Cherish families. Those are all great resources for people who are trying to escape. Definitely. And they're, they're helping out a ton down there. Even I have family that lives in the community right now and <laughs> There's still moms out there that don't have, obviously their husbands got sent away because they're supposed to be sending all their money back to Warren that, you know, that use those, uh, resources daily or whatever. I don't know how often they get food from whatever, but they do help and they are, um, helping families. Yes. You know, sometimes you see a charity, you're like, Oh yeah, it's probably a scam. But I think those two, at least I've seen it firsthand that they are handing out food. They are, um, helping people. They are helping moms that don't know how to help their own damn kids, right? Because, you know, they mm -hmm. all, the women got, you know, during 2017, they all got, kind of just got dumped. Everybody kind of got dumped. And if you weren't throwing your money at Warren Jeffs, you were going to get left. So a ton of these families and kids just got, you know, just dumped. Well, I'll make sure to put any resources that you have in the description below for anyone who's interested in either volunteering or if you're listening right now and you need help, you can go to any of those. And thank you guys for coming on and telling your story. You are amazing. I'm so happy that we finally got to do this. Thank you. Right, thank you.
<laughs> yeah. So for everyone else listening, thank you so much for joining us. And if you could comment some words of encouragement, that's amazing. Remember, our guests always read the comments and it helps the algorithm as well. Shoot it out to more people. And if you want to support the, the blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it's late at night. Here we go. <laughs> And if you want to support the podcast, it would be amazing if you could uh, buy some of our merch. We just got some merch in. We have Apostates Unite t-shirts. I'm sorry for what I said when I was in a cult. Linda, listen, fun stuff. <laughs> and we are actually putting together a C2C vacation where you can come hang out with us somewhere else in the world, get to know each other one-on-one. -on -one. I think there's going to be like eight to 20 spots depending on where we go. And if you're interested in that, we still haven't picked a location because we want to hear where you guys want to go. I'm going to leave a survey link in the description. Just fill that out. And probably within the next few weeks, we'll be announcing the trip based on your answers. So that would be amazing, too. And you can become a patron at patreon.com slash cults to consciousness. And if you like this video, I will leave two more videos down here below that you can click on. And until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious and be well. <laughs> <laughs>